Okay, where are we? Here, okay, but we're five minutes away from a break. Warm white blood cells. That's pretty good. That's not too bad. And so I kind of have a kind of a conglomeration of different things up over here. So let's talk about some of the uh, benign changes that occur with different types of cells. Now, we already know about neutrophils. We already know that when we have acute inflammation, especially when they do things like appendicitis, etc., we get absolute neutrophilic leukocytosis, right? Left shift, poxic granulation. Okay, so we know that. But I want to introduce you to two more terms. Leukemoid reaction. Okay, what does oid mean? Sounds like it isn't. So what are they saying? They're saying it looks like it's leukemia, but it isn't. It's something that's benign. Usually a leukemoid reaction can involve any of the cell lines. You can get leukemoid reactions in lymphocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, uh, and other cells. Okay? But let's talk about neutrophils. What causes leukemoid reactions? Well, usually serious infections, things like TB, uh, sepsis, and you get like greater than 30,000, greater than 50,000 cells in the peripheral blood. That's called leukemoid reaction. They like that. Okay, so it's a benign, or let's say an over-exaggerated response to an infection. Let me tell you who really gets these things, kids do. When kids get any kind of infection, otitis media, don't, don't be surprised to see if you've got to happen to get a CBC, a 30,000 neutrophil count. Do not be surprised. Okay, now if it was an adult with otitis media, maybe they had 12,000. Kid, 30,000, because they get an exaggerated response. And there's a certain type of uh, infection that scares the crap out of pediatricians, okay? Unfortunately, not pathologists, but pediatricians that scares them. And that is pertussis. If you have whooping cough, you get a rip-roaring lymphocytosis, big time. 60,000, not uncommon. So what do you think pediatricians go berserk? Why do they go so berserk with a 60,000 count, all of which are on lymphocytes? What do you think they're worried about? acute lipoblastic leukemia, except the problem is they don't have anemia and they don't have thrombocytopenia. But they literally come in pale, saying, could you please look at this purple blood? I got this kid, he's coughing and all that stuff, and I, I think it's pertussis, but I got 60,000 I said, I've already seen it. Matured lymphocytes are totally mature, they're not atypical, there's no anemia, no thrombocytopenia, it's pertussis. Okay, so that's called a leukemoid reaction. Okay? So that's what I wanted to introduce you to, and that's about it on that. Okay, here's lots of lymphocytes. You can see these things. Remember, kids often react with viral infections. They get uh, a lymphocytosis or with pertussis, they get a lymphocytosis. This is an atypical lymphocyte. I don't really like that term. Not that it matters. Who cares whether I like it or not. But basically, it's a lymphocyte that's doing what it's supposed to do when presented with antigen. It's responding to the antigen by dividing and getting bigger. So it's basically an antigenically stimulated lymphocyte. Now, I said atypical lymphocyte. What was the absolute first thing that went through your mind? Mono. Okay, but can I expand your knowledge a little bit? Okay. Mono isn't the only thing that can produce these large, beautiful, bluish staining cells. Cytomegalovirus can do it. Poxoplasmosis can do it. Any cause of hepatitis can do it. Viral hepatitis. And there's a drug that can do it that we already talked about once. And this drug produced a macrocytic anemia. Could you tell me what that drug was? It blocked intestinal conjugates. Phenytoin. Phenytoin produces an atypical lymphocytosis. So could you please expand your mind on atypical lymphocytes? Turns out that this is a patient that had uh, infectious mono. What's that due to? epstein barr virus. And it's usually transmitted by kissing. Okay, because the virus holds up in your salivary glands. And it infects what cell? Don't say T, say B. And what's the receptor? CD21. Very good. Okay. Now you all know about mono. You know that you get a viremia, generalized painful lymphadenopathy. You get an exudative tonsillitis very commonly. And most of the time it isn't group uh, A strep. Most of the time it's the virus itself that's producing that tonsillitis. They all have hepatitis but never have jaundice. I've never seen jaundice in, lupus, in uh, mononucleosis. Never. Never seen it. And the transaminases are off the map. I've seen 2,000, 3,000 SGPTs and, you know, and increased SGOTs. They never, never goes into chronic uh, disease, but they always have a hepatitis. Of course, they have a spleen that has a tendency for wanting to rupture. 
usually not spontaneously like they say. Usually some kid that's in high school that's got mono, you tell them, don't wrestle anymore, don't play football, and they don't listen to you, they get tackled, and they rupture their spleen, and they die, and they go after you and try to sue you. When you told them, don't do that. Okay, so you've got to be very careful, especially with high school kids that are in sports when they have mono. You write it down in your, in, your, in your stuff there, and you get that parent in there and say, do not let them for six to eight weeks do any contact sports, because their spleen can rupture. Do we understand each other? Okay, and, and then uh, usually the parents will get that and keep the kid from doing it, and you from getting law, a lawsuit. Okay, so let's break for ten. Okay, so I think we left off with an atypical lymphocyte. Terrible term to be called. Isn't it terrible when, you do, when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and they call you atypical? <laughs> I mean, you're reacting, you're reacting to the way you're supposed to. They say, you know what, you're atypical. They say, no, I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm energetically stimulated. You're still atypical. Okay. Now, forget that downy cell crap, okay? That's some jerk that's trying to get his name in print. Okay, so, you know, don't worry about downy cells and crap like that. I mean, good Lord in heaven. Okay. So they're, they're, they're big cells. They've got lots of cytoplasm. They kind of look like they're just flying through the blood. Okay, many, many things can cause. Now let's talk about mono. Okay, we talked about the hepatitis that usually uh, uh, does not have jaundice with it, that it doesn't become chronic. We talked about the big spleen. You all know that stuff. Okay, so where can you get screwed up? They'll give you a classic history. You know it's mono, and they'll say, which of the following tests do you order? And you're looking for mono spot, and it ain't there. Why is that? That's because that's a trade name. <laughs> and they don't use trade names on the exam. So what is it that a monospot is really trying to detect? Heterophile antibodies. Now let's break that word apart. What's hetero mean? Different. What's phile mean? Love. Loving. Different loving antibodies. What the heck does that mean? I know antibodies love each other. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking now. This is the these are the heterophile antibodies in mono, anti-horse antibodies, anti-horse RBC antibodies. Is that weird? A human has anti-horse red blood cell antibodies. That don't make any sense. So that's a different loving antibody. Also, how about anti-sheep red blood cell antibodies? I'm not a sheep. I don't go. Bah, bah. I don't do that. How come I have antibodies? That's why they're called heterophile antibodies. Okay. Doesn't mean I have to be perverted to get these either, by the way. I know a lot of you were thinking about that. Okay. You don't have to be perverted. You just get these antibodies. Okay. So, uh, those are what you're looking for in the monospot test. As a matter of fact, specifically anti-horse red blood cell antibodies is what you're looking for in the monospot because it's absolutely unique to mono. No other disease has those kinds of heterophile antibodies. And that's what they're looking for. So don't look for monospot. You ain't going to see it. Basically, you, you look for heterophile antibody test. And that will be the answer to that. By the way, once you have uh, mono, you always have it. You have the chance of developing uh, recurrent disease any time in your life. Most of the time, most people have three or four recurrences in a lifetime. My daughter had it when she was a teenager. She's developed it. You know, every now and then she gets swollen glands. She's very, very tired. Uh, and it just comes back for a little bit. Okay, so you never lose Epstein-Barr virus. You always have it. And where does it live? In your B cells. Actually, these are T cells. The atypical lymphocytes and, and mono are T cells that are reacting against the infected B cells. Okay. That's it for mono. Okay, this is a monocyte. And remember, the monocyte is the king of chronic inflammation. So we would expect monocytosis in patients that have chronic infections. Give me a couple examples. How about rheumatoid arthritis? Is that chronic? Sure. How about Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis? Is that chronic? Sure. Monocytosis. How about lupus and autoimmune disease? Is that chronic? Sure. So monocytosis is seen in chronic types of things. Malignancy, monocytosis. Okay. Now, the fun part is the eosinophil, and we've seen this slide already, and eosinophilia. Okay? So, to just kind of liven things up a little bit, you know, in the last dwindling hours or minutes of today, let's have a quiz. 
I can already hear the sphincters contracting. Okay, when I hear 100 sphincters contract, it makes a noise. And I just heard it because I said quiz. That's too close to test. Okay, and so there was a reaction to it. Okay, all you got to do is use your thumbs. Make believe you're Caesar, like in that movie Gladiator. Okay, what's this mean? Okay, okay, yes. What's this mean? No. This means you don't know. <laughs> kind of like that. Okay? Okay, so this, yeah, he's an affiliate. No. This, I have the slightest idea. Okay, you ready? Here we go. We'll start off easy. Hay fever. Okay, very good. Okay, rash in the patient with penicillin. Very good. Okay, I see something going like this. <laughs> Looking around. Okay, I give the answer. Very good. <laughs> Terrific. Quick, quick. The reflexes are so quick. That's good for this time of day. It means your ATP levels are fine. Probably on creatine. Why does creatine give you energy? Because it's what binds phosphate, and that's the phosphate that you get from making ATP. That's the only thing creatine does. So what, what, what serum test would be markedly elevated in someone that's taking creatine for their muscles? Creatinine! Because the end product of creatine metabolism is creatinine. And so they have creatinine levels as high as the ceiling. Okay? Of course, the B1 is normal. And that's because they're on creatine supplements. You know what? That's a board-worthy question. There's lots of people take creatine. Okay? And so they could put this down there and you see horrendously big-time creatinine levels in some guy that's a bodybuilder. The urea level's normal and you say, what's causing it? The answer is on creatine supplements. So many people do that. Okay, but anyway, that's moving along. So you're doing good so far. Now we're going to have real fun. Amabiasis. You're not moving your finger. You're not moving your finger. Okay, all he's doing is working on his nose. He's not, he's not, getting, at the, he's not getting his finger up. And it's the thumb he's using. That's the worst part of it. Okay. Okay. Okay, now. I have a bias issue. went like that, right? Pinworm. Okay. Uh, Strongyloides. Okay. Um, malaria. Okay. Well, you really got screwed up. No protozoa, but this is eosinophilia. So that rules out amoebiasis, that rules out malaria, that rules out giardia. No protozoa. Only invasive helminth. Is a pinworm invasive? No. It's not. You do not have eosinophilia with pinworm infection. Those are perverted worms. What do you mean they're perverted? The male and female take a trip down to your anus while you are sleeping. They mate in your anus. They lay eggs in your anus, which cause you to itch in your anus, and you scratch it while you are sleeping, and usually it ends up going in your mouth, and you reinfect yourself with your own eggs. That's perversion. But they do not invade... Your mucosa, there is no eosinophilia, guys, and pinworms. It's a classic board question that gets you. So no protozoal infections, only invasive helmets. A strongyloidus, of course. Adult ascariasis, no! Why? Because all they do is get together and obstruct your bowel. It's when they have a larval form that goes across your lungs. Remember that transmigration route it takes in there, and then you swallow it and then develop your... When you're going across the lungs, that's invasive. Then you have eosinophilia. But the adult ascariasis, no! No eosinophilia, because it's not invasive. So type 1 hypersensitivity. Anything type 1 hypersensitivity, yes. Anything protozoa, no. And in terms of worms, not adult ascariasis, no. Not pinworms, no. All the other ones, yes, because they invade. Whipworms, all that kind of crap. Okay, so gave you some points there. Gave it some points. Polycythemia is always asked on boards, one, two, and three, and so you have to have a real good concept of this. Okay, it means that you have an increased RBC count, hemoglobin, hematocrit. Now, this is when you really want to listen up on it's too bad it's this time of the day to be talking about something this important, but that's the way it is. 
Now, the first concept that I think is important, is there a difference between RBC mass versus count? Well, before I do that, is there a difference between serum sodium and total body sodium? Sure. Serum sodium is a milliequivalents per liter of plasma. Total body sodium is milliliters per kilogram of body weight, the total amount that you have. Similarly, RBC mass is the total number of RBCs you have in your entire body in milliliters per kilogram of your body weight. So it's all you have. It can be measured by radioactive technique. Red blood cell count is the number of RBCs you have in a microliter of blood. So it's how many you have in a certain volume of blood. That's the RBC count. Now, why am I making a big deal out of this thing? Listen, what if you, during the break, during lunch break, you went out and ran, and you got volume depleted? What would your RBC count be? It'd be high. Why? Because if you're volume depleted, then you'd be hemoconcentrating your red blood cells because it'd be a little less plasma volume than you were when you weren't running. Okay? So that would hemoconcentrate, so it would look like there's more RBCs per microliter of blood because you decrease plasma volume. If that's true, which it is, but what would the RB mass be? Do you, were, you, were you actually synthesizing more RBCs when you're running? So what would the RB, uh, RBC mass be? Normal. That's why that's important. Okay. So there's two types of polycythemia, relative and absolute. Relative is where you have a decrease in plasma volume causing an increase in RBC count but the RBC mass is normal. That's the, actually the most common cause of polycythemia right there. So let's say you really do have an absolute increase in RBCs. The next question is, is it appropriate or is it inappropriate? All right. What would be appropriate to have an increase in actual synthesis of RBCs? Tissue hypoxia. Any cause of tissue hypoxia you know would be an appropriate response. So if you have lung disease and you have hypoxemia, it would be appropriate for you to have it. COPDers always have high uh, RBC counts unless they're anemic from something. If you live at high altitudes, they always have a slightly higher RBC count than you. That's an, that's an appropriate polycythemia. Okay? But what if I had perfectly normal blood gases and I didn't have tissue hypoxia, yet I did have an increase in RBC mass? That would be inappropriate, wouldn't it? So there's two things that we have to think about when an R, when, it, when they increase in RBC mass is, a, is not an appropriate response. One is polycythemia rubrovera, which is an example of a myeloproliferative disease. That's a stem cell disease in the bone marrow. And when I say that, that means that the stem cells are kind of like dictators. They kind of no longer respond to checks and balances on them. And they basically will make whatever they want, when they want it, and nothing can tell them not to do it. So it's a neoplastic disease of stem cells. There is a propensity for going into leukemias in these things that you would expect because that's also a stem cell disease. So it would be inappropriate to have totally normal uh, uh, blood gases, no evidence of tissue hypoxia at all, and have an increased RBC mass. And of course, one, one thing is going to that polycythemia rubavera. The second one would be is if you had some uh, uh, tumor or some kind of cyst with an excess production of erythropoietin. So, for example, if you've got a renal adenocarcinoma making erythropoietin, causing an increase in RBC mass, is that an appropriate thing or inappropriate? It's inappropriate. It's a tumor that's just inappropriately making it. So, in review, polycythemia is relative or absolute? Relative means you just lost plasma volume, running, whatever. Uh, RBC count increased, but mass normal. Uh, it, uh, and then when we have an increase, an absolute increase in RBC mass, you have to ask yourself, is it an appropriate increase or is it inappropriate? What would be appropriate? Anything that's causing a hypoxic stimulus for erythropoietin release. That would be appropriate. Okay? If there isn't a hypoxic stimulus and you have an increased absolute RBC mass, then that means you're either ectopically making it with some tumor or some cyst or something like that in some tissue doing it, or you have polycythemia rubrovera, myeloproliferative disease. You got that so far? Okay. Now let's deal with polycythemia rubrovera. Now, I'm going to redefine myeloproliferative disease for you. It's a stem cell disease where it's neoplastic, where the stem cell has lost all regulation. Nothing can inhibit it anymore. Okay. Four diseases, sometimes people consider five diseases, fit under this definition. 
Polycythemia rubavera fits under this definition of myeloproliferative. Chronic myelogenous leukemia, that's the only leukemia that's put under this category. I think I know why they do it, um, but it's not important for you to know. So it's, it's considered myeloproliferative. Uh, three, agnogenic myeloid metaplasia. That's where the bone marrow is replaced by fibrous tissue. That's considered myeloproliferative. Four, uh, and the least common, uh, essential thrombocytemia. That's where the stem cell that makes uh, platelets just goes bananas, and you make 1,600,000 uh, platelets per microliter. That's another myeloproliferative. So those are the four main ones. Some people stick under this myelodysplastic syndrome which is a, a pre-leukemia type of syndrome. Some people call that myeloproliferative. Okay, so those are fit under it. Now let's deal with polycythemia rubavera. The easiest way of teaching of this is four H's. Four H's. First H, and most important H, hyperviscosity. Remember I told you Pousseau's law? Okay, total peripheral resistance equals viscosity divided by the radius to the fourth power. Remember that? Well, what do you think is going to happen if you have polycythemia? It's going to increase viscosity. What is that going to do to peripheral resistance? Increase it. Your blood's going to be sludging around like mad. And guess what it's going to predispose to if the viscosity is increased? Thrombosis. And it's thrombosis that kills you in any polycythemic state, in particular polycythemia rubavera. Thrombosis of what? Anything you want. Dural sinuses. Hepatic vein, Bud Chiari. In fact, the most common cause of Bud Chiari syndrome, hepatic vein thrombosis is polycythemia. Coronary artery, superior mesenteric vein, you name it. Anything you want can be thrombosed if you have blood literally sludging around because you have hyperviscosity. See, that's why they do phlebotomies, guys. They do phlebotomy to reduce viscosity so you don't thrombose. Let me tell you another reason why they do phlebotomies, to create iron deficiency. They want to make you iron deficient. You say, that's pretty strange. Why would you want to make someone iron deficient? Because if you make them iron deficient, it's going to take longer time to make more RBCs. You're going to have to get more iron stores back before you begin making more, more RBCs. You're just slowing down the process. So you purposely make them iron deficient. That's weird, isn't it? Okay, so that's what hyperviscosity. And if you don't remember anything else, that's probably the most important one. Okay, because that's the one that kills them. Hypervolemia. It's the only polycythemia where there's also an increase in plasma volume that matches the increase in RBC mass. None of the other causes of polycythemia have an increase in plasma volume. Now, both RBC mass and plasma volume can be measured by radioactive techniques that are done in most big-time big hospitals can do both. So it's very unique for polycythemia rubavera to have an increase in plasma volume. My impression of why that's true Myeloproliferative diseases take years and years and years to develop. And so I think that what's happening is, because it's such a slow process, the plasma volume is able to keep pace with the RBC mass, and so they both kind of go up together because it takes so long, as opposed to other things that might be shorter. That's what I think. Who cares? It's increased, and it's very useful. Third age, hyper... Uh, what's the third age? Is um, histaminemia. All cells are increased. RBCs, white blood cells, and platelets and polycythemia, including mast cells and basophils. Here's a classic pearl for you. Patients with polycythemia very commonly will come to you with a history like this. They'll say, Doc, when I take a shower, hot, warm, cold, doesn't really matter, I itch all over my body. That is a tip-off for my polycythemia rubavera. Why? Because... Mass cells are increasing, and you know they're in the skin. And temperatures, temperature changes can degranulate mast cells, causing them to release histamine. And you get generalized itching. Guys, there's very few things that produce generalized itching. And one of them is bile salt deposition in your skin in patients with obstructive jaundice. That's one thing. And the second is mast cell degranulation. That's it. Those are the only things I can with is generalized pruritus. That's a very, very big one. Okay. And that relates to the uh, increase in histamine release from mast cells. Also, remember they get that face that's kind of ruddy, very red looking. I bet most of you thought like I did, that's due to the increase in RBC mass, right? They're all congested in uh -huh. No, no, that redness is due to histamine, producing vasodilatation. 
They get headaches like migraines, very, very common in this disease. The last H is hyperuricemia. As a concept there, guys, hyperuricemia, because nucleated hematopoietic cells are elevated, like neutrophils and stuff like that, and when they die, uh, nuclei they have the purines in them. And so the purines are going to have to go into and be uh, go into the purine metabolism, and the end product of that is uric acid. That's a concept you've got to remember on the exam. I'm sure our friend, the guy that's, that has that little accent that sounds like English, okay, I'm sure he told you that when you have cancers, okay, and you're going to treat them with a chemotherapy drug, and they're going to die, a lot of cancer cells are going to die, you always have to put them on what drug to prevent them from going into renal failure from urate nephropathy, from all this uric acid. What's the drug? Allopurinol. You have to do that. You have to block xanthine oxidase because you're going to be releasing millions and millions of purines when you kill those nucleated cells. And they're going to go down there and they're going to form uric acid and your tubules are going to be filled up with uric acid and you're going to go into renal failure. You have to put them on allopurinol. Okay? That's called a tumor lysis syndrome if you want to know a name for that. Well, the same thing happens... And polycythemia rubiferin got such an increase in number of cells, they eventually die, you run the risk of hyperuricemia. So that's the key things for that one. Believe it or not, you're ready to fill in the blanks. So there's the blanks. I'm going to go call and turn really quick. To them. No, I don't want you to turn. I want you to do this on your own, all by your lonesome. Are you ready? Okay, we have RBC mass, not count, mass, plasma volume, Oxygen saturation and erythropoietin. You ready? Okay, how, what would you put in for polycythemia rubiver for RBC mass? Increase. Good. Good so far. Plasma volume. Increase. Very good. Now think. Now you're going to have to think. Oxygen saturation. Normal. Very good. It's inappropriate polycythemia. Now think. Think. Think O2 content. 1.34 times the hemoglobin times the oxygen saturation plus the PO2. That's the hint. What's the erythropoietin level? Low. Decreased. You've got piles of oxygen because you have piles of RBCs and that would suppress erythropoietin. So you have low erythropoietin levels. It's a hormone, guys. Remember, hormones have to have some checks and balances. So if you've got enough oxygen, erythropoietin suppressed. If you don't, it goes up. Okay, so in review, we have an increase in mass, volume, Normal O2 sat, low erythropoietin. All right, how about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Let's throw another one in. Tetralogy of fellow. Uh, put another one in. Someone living in Breckenridge, Colorado. And way up there. That's where my daughter lives. Okay? What would the RBC mass be in these patients? High. Okay. What would the plasma volume be? Normal. What would the O2 saturation be? Decreased. Very good. And what would the erythropoietin level be? Increased. See, it's an appropriate polycythemia because it's relating to the presence of hypoxic stimulus. Good. You're doing good. This is wonderful. You're doing wonderful. Okay, let's say I have a renal adenocarcinoma and they got polycythemia. Okay. So what do you think the RBC mass is? Increased. Plasma volume? Normal. Oxygen saturation? Normal. Erythropoietin? Increased. Well, that shouldn't be, right? If you've got normal gas studies, you shouldn't have an increase in erythropoietin. Why, did it, why was it increased? It's being ectopically produced. So I could have used, uh, used a hepatocellular cellular carcinoma. You know, it can be anything. It's not always neoplasms where you can get ectopic secretion. Re any renal cyst can do it. In fact, you could just look at the kidney like this, and it could cause it to increase erythropoietin. Okay? I mean, it just, it just, it doesn't, it can be anything that does it. Hydronephrosis, Wilms tumor, anything in the kidney can cause it to just make too much erythropoietin, not just cancer. Well, I've got one thing left. That's your relative's polycythemia. No, it's relative, <laughs> it's relative polycythemia. RBC mass, normal. Plasma volume, decrease, and of course everything else is normal. Guys, that's it, that's as, that's as, that's as hard as it can possibly get on part one, two, or three. You got all those things, you're polycythemia accredited. All right? Take a look at this slide, guys. 
because according to a student that was sitting in this classroom in earlier spring, they said this slide was on your test, which doesn't surprise me because it's the pathologist that puts the slides on your exam, and I happened to talk to that pathologist at one time when he was drunk. <laughs> that guy just about told me everything. Okay. I said, you get the slides from existing pathology slides. It's not your, oh, yeah, yeah, we're not going to make any pictures for the test. Nah, blah, blah, blah. Say so. You know, all pathologists have great slide sets. I mean, that's like collecting butterflies for us, slides, you know. And so there, we, we have all the slides, so I'm not surprised. And I said, hey, isn't it true? Isn't it true? Remember when we took our path boards? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Isn't it true that most of the time, let's say 90% of the time, don't even have to look at the slide to answer the question because they give it away in the stem? Oh, yeah, but 10%, 10%, you got to really look at it. Oh, okay, that's just what I thought. Okay, so most of the time you do not. I remember when I was taking my path boards, I was like 30 ahead on the slides because I went about this, 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 this. And then when the slide came up after about a minute and a half, I just double check I was right. And it's the same thing on this boards. Most of the time you do not even have to look at the, at the, at the picture, whatever it is they're giving, because it just absolutely gives it away. But I'll look at it, you know, but you really in most cases don't have to. So don't worry about slides because you'll be able to figure it out even without it. You just give it away. Well, this is chronic myelogenous leukemia. And before we do this, I want to describe what, a what you find in leukemia, so that's going to help you in being able to recognize that it's leukemia they are talking about, and then what type of leukemia it is. And you want to know what? This is really easy. In fact, in fact if you can remember the age brackets for leukemia, you'll get all the questions right on leukemia. So remember, we said it's a malignancy, of stem cells in the marrow, and it metastasize anywhere it wants. So that means you're always going to have generalized lymphadenopathy, hepatal splenomegaly, da 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 da. That's, that's a given. You're going to have that. Okay, second, you're going to have abnormal cells in the peripheral blood. Blasts. That could be myeloblasts, lymphoblasts, um, what else? My West, monoblasts. Make a carrier blast, any blast you want, okay? I'm going to have a blast, that blast could be out there too, okay? So it's going to be some abnormal cells that are blast out in the peripheral blood, in all the leukemias, okay? Uh, third, because it's arising in the bone marrow, it's going to crowd out all the normal abanoportic cells. You're always going to have anemia, always, usually normocytic, okay? Second, Usually, 99% of the time, thrombocytopenia, because you're crowding out the normal megakaryocytes for making, for making platelets. And you're going to have, usually, not always, an increase in the count, white blood cell count, with these abnormal cells present. Okay? You with me so far? The only other thing you've got left to know is, what separates acute from chronic leukemia? Simple, you've got to do bone marrow. You've got to do bone marrow anyway. And you count blasts. And if it turns out that the number of blasts is less than 30% of the uh, white blood cells in the marrow, then that would qualify as chronic. If the percent blast is over 30%, it's acute. So a blast count determines whether it's acute versus chronic. That's how you can tell. Now all we've got to do is age brackets, and this is absolutely idiot-proof for boards. If we're talking about 0 to 14 years of age, what's the leukemia? ALO. That's number one. All right. That's, that's a given. 15 to 39. Acute myelogenous leukemia. And what do you think the cell's going to be if they happen to put a picture of it up? A myeloblast with one in it. In our right. So 15 to 39 is acute myelogenous leukemia. Okay. From 40 to about 59 years of age, two. Acute myelogenous leukemia and chronic myelogenous leukemia. So they're more like you know, 30, uh, 39, or 40 to 59 years of age. A little favor of acute. You're talking about 60 and over, you're talking about chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Guys, they always give you the age. They literally give it away when they do that. They literally give it away. I've had many students say, you know what, Dr. Goyan, i got everyone on that leukemia is right. There's no doubt about it. I said, and I got all of them just by age. It's that simple. Okay, so what this quiz is, 0 to 14, ALL, 
15 to 39. AML, what are you usually going to see in the peripheral blood? Glass with our eyes, okay? Uh, 40 to 59. AML, CML. How are you going to separate those two? Bone marrow, okay? What's CML going to have? Less than 30% glass. What's AML going to have? Greater than 30%. Of course, there'll be a couple other things for CML that we also, you already know, Philadelphia chromosome, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, what about all 16 over? CLO, very simple. As a matter of fact, CLO is the most common overall leukemia regardless of age. That's how common it is. When I was practicing in Yuma, Arizona, in one week, in the wintertime, when all the snowbirds came, that's the people that live up in the north and they come down to the southwest, Okay, I would diagnose CLO five times a week. Okay, it was that common. I mean, and we see this, this is just like, it's just so common. So it's the most common leukemia, that's one. It's certainly the most common leukemia after 60. Now listen to this one. It's the most common cause of generalized, non-tender lymphadenopathy in someone over 60. Now is that because it's a lymphoma? No. It's because of what? It metastasizes to lymph nodes. Every one of those things has been on an exam. So it's very simple. They say you've got a 62 year old dog who's got generalized non tender lymphadenopathy. <clears throat> Answer chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Don't pick malignant lymphoma because that's not going to be right. It's going to be chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Okay, this is. Let me give you the history on this so you can see how easy it'll be to recognize, even though you know the answer already. This is a uh, purple smear from a 49 year old man. He's got 150,000 white blood cell count. He's got 1% uh, myeloblastinous peripheral blood and bone marrow at examination. He's got generalized non-tender lymphadenopathy, hepatal splenomegaly, thrombocytopenia, normal cytic anemia. Diagnosis, chronic myeloidus leukemia. There you go. It's right age bracket, right percentage of blast. Now, what tests are you going to get to prove it? You're going to get a Philadelphia chromosome study. Okay, remember that's that 922 translocation of what, what proto-oncogene? ABLA. Remember that has non-receptor tyrosine kinase activity. And when you translocate it from 9 to 22 and fuses with the break cluster region, forms this fusion gene, that's the Philadelphia chromosome. Um, there is a stain that you can also use called leukocyte alkaline phosphatase. We would take this smear right here and we would overlay this stain on it uh, and see which cells, which neutrophils in this, in this smear would take up the stain for alkaline phosphatase. Here's the concept. Mature neutrophils all have alkaline phosphatase in them. Neoplastic neutrophils do not. Why? Because they're neoplastic. That's the clue. And so it's, good. it's actually a very easy test to do in chronic myelogenous leukemia because we overlay it over it and we look for of the stain and see if there's any staining. There's no stain. Because we look at the neutrophils. We look at that cell, which is a segmented neutrophil, there'd be no stain. If that was benign, it would have had taken up the stain. But there isn't any. So you count a hundred of these things in there and you grade them from zero to four on intensity of stain and it's usually a hundred zeros. <laughs> okay? And so you add it all up and I think it doesn't take higher math to figure out that a hundred zeros equals zero score. And that's called a leukocyte alkaline phosphatase score. It's always low in chronic myelogenous leukemia. So what are the two main tests for proving that your diagnosis is chronic myelogenous leukemia? The Philadelphia chromosome study, and what's the other one? Leukocyte alkaline phosphatase score, which is low, usually like zero. Good. Excellent. We'll do other leukemias in a second. All right. What does that look like? A teardrop. That's right. You little tear. <laughs> it's crying. Why? Because there was this dictator that used to live, and I'm going to tell you the story of this. There was a dictator that used to live in the bone marrow, and it said, attention, hematopoietic cells. We are going to move. Of course, there was a big, big, uh, you know, uh, uh, up to do about this thing. Okay? And, it's, and, they, and everyone said, where? And it said, spleen. Okay, so the big, it was a migration of hematopoietic cells from the bone marrow to the spleen. Now, when you take up hematopoiesis in a place 
other than the bone marrow, there's a name for that. And you know it has to be extra medullary hematopoiesis. That's the term we apply when the hematopoietic cells go someplace else to make their cells. Why the spleen? I don't know. They can do it in other places, but it's a reasonably big organ, so they can do it. And so the spleen is huge. Some of the biggest spleens you will ever feel will be in this disease called agnogenic myeloid metaplasia. And it's a smart dictator. It knows that some people are going to complain and they want to go back. And so he sends back some megakaryocytes and say, okay, you go back to the marrow and I want you to lay down collagen all the way throughout the marrow so that nobody can go back and find a place to live. And so that's what happens. The megakaryocyte goes back, follows out the order, and fibrosis the entire stinking bone marrow. And that's why the old term for this was myelofibrosis and myeloid metaplasia. Now they call it agnogenic myeloid metaplasia. Well, remember, there's always 10% of people that never get the message. And so some dudes never heard, we're moving to the spleen. And so a few dudes will hang around, even in that fibrotic marrow, and do their thing. Okay, like red blood cells. But to get out into the sinusoids, they're going to have to worm their way through strands of fibrous tissue that oftentimes damages their membrane. Plus it hurts. And so when it hurts, what do you do? You cry. And so in the process of coming out and hurting itself, getting through all this barbed wire, fibrous tissue, and getting into the sinusoid, it finally makes it into the peripheral blood, but it's been irreparably damaged. It hurts, they cry, and they permanently identify themselves as a teardrop. It's so sad. It's a sad story. And I get so sad every time I tell this story. Okay? And it's a wonderful marker for this particular disease. So somebody that has this huge spleen with teardrop cells has what disease? Agnogenic myeloid metaplasia. Very good. Now, would you say there's too many platelets in this? Say yes. Okay? And uh, this is the myeloproliferative disease. They never ask on board. This is essential thrombocytemia. That's a, a neoplastic stem cell that wants to make too many platelets. And that's all I'm going to say on that one. Okay, we're ready for the other leukemias. I'm going to give you history. You're going to tell me the diagnosis. You ready? Let's look at this one up here on the left. Okay, this is a patient that's four years old that presents with sternal tenderness, fever, generalized non-tender lymphadenopathy, hepatal splenomegaly, normal cytic anemia, um, 50,000 white blood cell count, uh, many of which have very abnormal appearing cells like these. Okay? What's your diagnosis? ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Okay? And these, you don't have to identify those as lymphoblasts. You don't need to. You already know it's ALL. Remember, that's the most common cancer in kids, too. Remember that? Okay. There's one thing, maybe two things you need to know about ALL for part one, and that is the most common type. Actually, has the word common in it. It's common ALL antigen. Um, B-cell leukemia. Remember, that's a Kala antigen. And it even has a cluster designation. Do you remember what the cluster designation for the Kala antigen was? 10. So it's, it's CD10 positive, Kala antigen positive, B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And that's all you need to know for part one. Part two, you would need to know a few more things about remission, induction therapy, and that kind of crap, not for part one. All right, so you got that one. Very good. Let's go to this one. Okay, this is a peripheral blood from a 65-year-old man who has generalized non-tender lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, uh, normal cytic anemia, rhombocytopenia, I think I said, and 90,000 white blood cell count, almost all the cells resembling these cells up here with these a couple smudge cells around. An uh, additional interesting thing is this patient also has hypogammaglobulinemia. What's the patient have? Chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And I'm going to ask you a question. Why do they have hypogammaglobulinemia? Because these are neoplastic B cells, guys. Can they change into plasma cells if they're neoplastic? No. So why would they have hypogammaglobulinemia? Because then the neoplastic B cells, they can't transform into plasma cells to make gamma globulin. So what's the most common cause of death in these patients? Infection related to hypogammaglobulinemia. That's right. Okay. You already knew the answer was when I said 65. 
If you didn't know that, then you already knew the answer when I said generalized non-tender lymphadenopathy. I didn't have to say anything anymore. You knew it was still again CLL. All right. Now, this one I didn't tell you, but you probably all know this. This is a patient, probably 62, has splenomegaly, generalized, uh, usually they don't have generalized, but let's say hepatal splenomegaly, big, big, big old spleen, and they have these weirdo-looking cells with kind of these little little projections of the cytoplasm, and a special stain was ordered on these cells to make the diagnosis. What was that special stain? Trap, the trap stain, tartrate-resistant acid phosphatase stain. And what cancer is this? What leukemia? Hairy cell leukemia. Very rare. I may be seen three cases in my entire life. The only thing they ever ask about hairy cell leukemia is that stain. TRAP is the abbreviation. Tartrate resistant acid phosphatase. Okay. And that's it on that. Have you seen this slide before? Yeah, that's the hour rods. Okay, so this is a purple smear from a patient that is uh, 35 who has uh, uh, generalized, who has, let's say, a, a 50,000 white blood cell count with many abnormal cells appearing like this in it, has a 70% a, a blast in the bone marrow, anemia, thrombocytopenia, what's your diagnosis? Acute myelogenous leukemia, okay? And what are these called? Hour rods, which really are abnormal lysosomes, actually. Little splinters, they look like little red splinters in the bone marrow is what they are. Okay. Uh, here's a few more over here. Now, I know that most of you were forced to memorize the French-American-British classification of M0 to M7. Is that correct? You should have taken your instructors and hung them up by their toenails, okay, because they never asked that on boards. One, two, or three. Do googly ammos and all that bull crap? Don't worry about it. If you're going into hematology or internal medicine, that will be on your boards. There's only a couple things you need to know about these acute leukemias. You need to know what an hour rod looks like. You need to know the leukemia that likes to infiltrate gums. Could you name that one for me? Acute monocytic leukemia likes to invade gums, and there it is right there. For those of you that memorize them, you know that's M5, okay? And this one you need to know. This one. Now talk about hour rods. This one over here is so full of them, it doesn't have any cytoplasm left. And, 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 and so many of them even got out into the blood here. This is acute progranulocytic leukemia. This is M3. They always have DIC. So of all the leukemias, this is numero uno <clears throat> for disseminated intravascular coagulation. Second, it's got a translocation, 1517. Third, you treat it with what? Retinoic acid, which is vitamin A. And how did it work? It causes these blasts to mature into benign cells. Isn't that incredible? It maturates them so that they can form, they become benign cells. That's amazing. Every one of those things I just said is on the boards. The translocation, the treatment, how the treatment works, the DIC relationship, all of them are, I've been asked as individual questions on the boards. It's that important. Okay? That's it. Those are, those are your leukemias. We've done our anemias. We've got 15 minutes. And exactly 15 minutes, I can finish, and finish all you need to know about lymph nodes, too. <laughs> yeah. Why? Because they never ask any questions other than, let's say, things like Hodgkin's disease and stuff like that. It's nothing. So 15 minutes, we'll be done with this, too. So tomorrow, we can do coagulation, blood bank, and then start cardiovascular and even do respiratory. All tomorrow. We'll understand what our heart and lungs are doing. We'll understand the concept of the pathology of love when we talk about the heart. Am I on the right side? Yeah, left side. Okay. Yes, there are changes that occur in the heart when you're in love. Okay? It pounds more. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a palpitation that you can feel even when you're lying down. It's just boom, boom, boom. You say, I wonder what's the matter with me. It's love. Isn't that cool? Love causes your heart to pound. I really like that. Is your heart pounding at all? Not really. It never has. <laughs> Maybe when I run it pounds, and that's about it. <laughs> when I had Graves' disease, it really pounded. That's nice. Okay. That's too bad that you haven't had that. Okay, guys, you see this lift note up here? 
You ever had a, a lymph node in your neck that hurt when you pressed on it? Let me show you how easy this is. If you have a lymphadenopathy and it hurts, it's never malignant. How about that for a start? Because what it means is you have some kind of inflammation that's causing it. So painful lymphadenopathy is never malignant. It's not leukemia. It's not lymphoma. It's some inflammatory condition, which doesn't always mean infection. You have generalized lymphadenopathy at lupus, but it's painful lymphadenopathy because you're stretching the capsule. It's an inflammatory condition, and that produces pain. Okay? When you have non-tender lymphadenopathy, always think malignant. The first thing you think about is metastasis to it, or the second thing you think about, you have a primary lymphoma originating from it. Do they always tell you whether it's painful or painless? Always. So they say painless, you're not going to pick any answer that deals with uh, cancer or lymphomas. You're going to pick something that's inflammatory. You with me so far? Okay, you can have localized lymphadenopathy and generalized. What does generalized mean to you? Let's say generalized painful lymphadenopathy. A systemic disease. A systemic inflammatory disease. That's what it should mean to you. Okay? So in HIV, they all have lymphadenopathy. Is it generalized? Of course. It's a generalized disease. It's a viremia. So it's generalized. How about Epstein Barr? It's generalized. Yeah, of course. Lupus. Is that a systemic disease? It's called systemic lupus erythematosus. It's generalized. But if you have exudative tonsillitis, is that generalized? Of course not. It's just going to go to the local nodes, and that's going to hurt. Now, how about breast cancer? Is that generalized non-tender lymphadenopathy? No, it just goes to the local regional nodes. All of these things are put into the stem of the question, and it literally narrows down the list of possibilities to something very simple to pick out. Painful, inflammatory. Painless, cancer. Localized, painful, some infection draining something. Localized, non-painful, some cancer that's draining, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's spreading to that lymph node. You with me? Okay? All right. Now, they have pictures commonly of a lymph node, guys, on the boards. And they have arrows pointing to it. This is the sinus of the lymph node here, and so that would be probably A. Then this little jobby here would be B, and then the stuff in between would be C. Okay? You ready? If you have Bruton's A gamma globulinemia, which one of these areas, the sinus, the germinal follicle, or this area would be absent? The germinal follicle, because what's in the germinal follicle? B cells. It'd be absent, be gone. Now, if you had the George syndrome, which part of this lymph node would be screwed up? This part, the paratrabecular, because that's T cell country. You would see absolutely none of this, nor you would see your germinal follicles. Now, what if you had histiocytosis X? That means Hanshula Christian, letter of seaweed disease, okay? which is a true histiocytic CD1 positive tumor. Where would you see that? Right here. So sinuses have histiocytes. That's good. What if you had severe combined immunodeficiency due to adenine deaminase deficiency? You would have none of these and none of these, but you would have histiocytes because that's a combined B and T lymphocyte uh, deficiency. Are you with me? That's how they ask it. You see, when, when macrophages process antigen and they deliver them to B cells, that's what causes these germinal follicles. These are B cells that are in the process of dividing and dividing and dividing, and what's the end product going to be when it comes out of this germinal follicle? A plasma cell, which is going to be making what? Antibodies. This is called, the, this is just called uh, reactive uh, lymphadenopathy. This could be lupus. This could be something draining your, uh, your tonsillitis. Whatever it is, it's benign. Do you see anything different? I mean, these look like follicles, okay? But isn't it have a little bit of different demarcation, light stain, darker stain? There's a little bit of difference in the types of cell populations. This looks like everything looks like it's the same, even though it's forming follicles. What is this? This is a malignant lymphoma. In fact, you've already seen this slide before. What, what's the origin of this? If you've got these things that look like follicles, what do you think of Follicular lymphoma. And what do you think it's of what cells? B cells. This is your most common non-Hodgkin's malignant lymphoma. What else did I tell you was strange about this particular tumor? Translocation, 1418, and what happened when you translocated it? What was knocked off? The apoptosis gene. And so the cells are now immortal. Okay? See, this picture was on boards. 
Can you tell where it was taken from, a cross-section from? What do you think this is with the little cartilage in there? And what do you think these little elastic arteries from? Okay, this is the trachea, and these are branches of your elastic arteries. This is lymphoma. Remember, they used to describe lymphoma as fish flesh? It looks like fish flesh. Which kind? Flounder. How about that? Okay? Well, if you like red snapper, a red snapper look. But do you see something strange about this tumor? Is it invading the, through the cartilage? Is it invading or avoiding the elastic arteries? Okay, so you learned another concept. What two tissues are resistant to invasion by cancer cells? Cartilage and elastic tissue. That was a board question. Mm -hmm. So I killed two birds with one stone by showing this thing up. Now when I say I killed two birds with one stone, do you think that means when I throw a stone, two birds fall over dead? If you do, you're schizophrenic. <laughs> <laughs> a rolling stone gathers no moss. What does that mean? Well, that's simple. Duh, that's simple. The stone going so fast that moss can't stick to it. Hospital. Psychiatric consult. That's concrete thinking. Okay, so that's one of the things that happens, of course. When you're schizophrenic, you lose concrete thinking. You I mean that's all you have is concrete thinking. You can't think abstractly. And so you use these terms and, uh, and you see how they answer. It's one of the tip offs. And then, of course, you ask them, the people talking to you all the time. Like right now? Well, you're talking to me. That's not, that's not some kind of auditory hallucination. Okay, that just, whatever. Okay, so uh, you can't invade elastic tissue and cartilage with tumor. Very rare. You've seen this slide before? Okay, what did the kid have? Broke his lymphoma. What was it due to? Epstein Barr virus. What was the translocation exactly? A14. And what did it translocate from A? MYC oncogene, MYC. Okay. Now, you probably learned that the, the, uh, the morphology of a broken lymphoma is a starry sky appearance. Remember that? Okay. Well, what were the stars? These dudes. These are no. This is not lymphoma. These are just normal benign macrophages which look like stars in the black night of the sky. That's what these, these are supposed to be the black night of the sky. Starry sky, okay, appearance. These little cells here are the broken lymphoma cells. These little things are macrophages, so it looks like stars in a, in a nighttime sky. It's very characteristic of broken lymphoma. About number three, most common cancer in kids. Right now, it's got a fantastic, fantastic, uh, there's a French chemotherapy system. We can actually cure this disease now. There's a little dude that just basically recovered from Burkitt's lymphoma that was in his face. And in the United States, we don't get it usually in the jaw, but this kid did. In the United States, Burkitt's lymphoma is the most common lymphoma in kids that's in the abdomen. Usually pyrus patches, pyreotic lymph nodes, somewhere there. It's rarely ever in the... Uh, on the jaw. Burkitt's lymphoma that looks like this is more common in Africa. Burkitt's lymphoma in kids in our country is more in the abdominal cavity, pyreotic nodes, pyrus patches, something like that. Even testicle. Even testicle sometimes it, it involves that. That's all I have to say about Burkitt's. Now this person really looks like he's got some problem there. Okay? He's got these little plaque-like lesions. First of all, he's got no teeth. That's one problem. He's got, he's got these plaque-like lesions, and most people said, you know, this guy's got some rip ruin fungal infection, okay? Because they took sections through it, and they saw these inflammatory, what they thought were inflammatory cells in the, in the epidermis, and it's said, ah, sure, I know it is, but they couldn't find any fungus. So they had said, okay, let's call this mycosis fungoides, okay? Because it's got to be a fungus even though we can't find it. Well, it turns out that those inflammatory cells that they thought that were, were present in the skin were actually the neoplastic cell. I can't guess what they were. Of all things, helper T cells. So the neoplastic cell in mycosis fungoides is a helper T cell. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's a dude that helps everybody. It's not helping this dude a whole lot. Okay? And so it's a T cell malignancy that usually involves skin as well as other organs, including... Uh, lymph nodes. Now look at that cell. Well, that's a cell that's called a sensory cell. You see, what's interesting is because idiots like to get their names in print. 
They knew this was mycosis fungoides, but when one of those malignant helper T cells gets into the peripheral blood, ah, we're going to call it something different now. We're going to call this now Cesare syndrome. And so that's what causes confusion with students. It's basically the same thing as this, except some of the malignant cells got into the peripheral blood. Okay, this is an electron micrograph down here of a child that had a rash on the skin, an eczematous rash all over. A generalized non-tender lymphadenopathy, hepatal splenomegaly. So you know it's bad. A biopsy was done of the rash, and it was a monomorphic infiltrate of cells that was CD1 positive. And so they did an electron microscopy of those monomorphic appearing cells, and it showed this structure in it. Well, first of all, what does the patient have? It has a malignant histiocytic lesion, in this case, letter of seaweed disease. The fact that I said CD1 proved to you was a histiocytic disease. And what do you think this is called? A burbic granule. What does that look like to you? A tennis racket. Now look at it again. I want to see how good you are at integrating. There's a bacteria that's a spore former that has a terminal end spore that also looks like a tennis racket. Who am I? Clostridium tetany. That sounds pretty close to tennis, doesn't it? Clostridium tetany also has a spore at the end of it. Remember, spores don't take up the stain because they're within the, the bacillus. And so when I see a burbic granule that looks like a tennis racket in a histiocyte, the very next thing that I associate that with is a uh, Clostridium tetany spore. And so I can keep these two concepts in my mind, even though they're not related to each other. So this is a burbic granule. All right. Hodgkin's disease. Hodgkin's disease. You know, they still call it disease. You want to know why? Because anyone with fever, night sweats, and weight loss has got to have TB to prove another otherwise, right? Right? Okay. And so, these patients would come in with uh, localized, but they would be non-tender lymphadenopathy. They'd biopsy these things, and they'd look at their lymph nodes, and they'd look and say, Oh, look at this. These are all benign. And they see these little dudes over there and say, Hi, look who's looking at me. they got the cell looking at me. That one. Okay, he is. He's got an ophthalmoplegia because that eye's going that direction. And so they probably, the pathologist waved that in under the microscope. Hi, little cell. Let's find a malignant cell. Okay. So who would have thought that that was a malignant cell? Because all these uh, lymphocytes are benign. No wonder why they thought it was a disease. Fever, night sweats, and weight loss. They biopsy the lymph node and they see these things. How could that be malignant? It is. That's the neoplastic cell of Hodgkin's disease, and it's got a name. Name it. Reed Sternberg cell. That's what you guys call owl eyes. Okay, you call it an owl eye. It looks like an owl with the eyes in there, okay? Well, that's an owl eye. So is cytomegalovirus with owl eye. So is Giardia an owl eye. So is... Uh, uh, the Ashoff nodule rheumatic fever in owl eye. There's so many stinking owl eyes. Forget it. Okay. That's the neoplastic cell, guys, of Hodgkin's disease, of Reed Sternberg cell. Not these other lymphocytes. That would be a lymphoma, a regular lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The malignant cell in Hodgkin's disease is the Reed Sternberg cell. So if this is true, and it is, the less number of these things that you had the better the prognosis, the more that you would have, the worse. Does that make sense? You don't really need to know all the different types of Hodgkin's disease for part one. Lipocyte uh, predominant, nodular sclerosing, you know, mixed cellularity. You don't need to know that at all. All you need to know is, what is the malignant cell? Reed Sternberg cell. What's the most common one? That's the one this woman had. <laughs> I think maybe that that was a message. Isn't that amazing? That was exactly 5 o'clock. Okay, we break. So you'll find out the rest of the story tomorrow morning. That's if you're here. Okay. Let's situate ourselves. Get our little butzos in the seat so. Butso means but, by the way, in uh, uh, some kind of language. Pretty big dude. Pretty big dude there. It's called big dude. Big dude.
What do you do when you see a big dude? Sir. You should use the word sir. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, continue on with uh, lymph nodes. Remember we went through uh, probably the most important thing, and that is that when they describe painful lymphadenopathy, what does that mean? It's some inflammatory condition. It does not mean malignant. Okay? Okay? And if it's painless, in general, what does that mean? Malignant. And what's the most common malignancy of a lymph node? Metastasis. What's the most common cancer, primary cancer of a lymph node? Malignant non-Hodgkin's malignant lymphoma. What actually is that, is that, uh, that tumor? It's a follicular B-cell lymphoma. Anybody remember the translocation? 1418. And what essentially happened when you did that translocation? You knocked off the apoptosis gene, and so now that cell is immortal. Not immortal, immortal. There you go. That, that Brooklyn accent always comes in there, immortal. Yeah. You would have my sister. She lives out in Huntington. Huntington Station, out in Suffolk. God almighty. What an accent. Who? You live there in Huntington Station? Would you come in by train? Oh, you fly in? <laughs> That's really cool. That's cool. Okay, Hodgkin's disease. Uh, there's four types. You only need to know one. And that's the most common one. And interestingly, it's more common in women than men, whereas all the other types are more common in men than in women. It's called nodular sclerosing Hodgkins. And it actually means what it says, nodular. I mean, it's a, a low power of a lymph node with nodular sclerosing. I think you get this nodular appearance, so that, that makes sense. Sclerosis means lots of you know, collagen deposition. Well, that's what all this pink crap is in here. So you can see it. this would be a hard, non-painful node. And here's how you're going to recognize it. Very, very simple to recognize Hodgkin's disease. It'll usually be a woman, at least we're talk, talking about boards, and she'll have lymph node involvement in two places. Okay? One is always the anterior mediastinum. Okay? So one of those locations is nodes in the anterior mediastinum. The second is somewhere above the diaphragm. It could be in the cervical nodes, it could be a supraclavicular node, something like that. So it's in two different places. One is in the anterior mediastinum, and the other is somewhere in one other area above the diaphragm, neck, supraclavicular, something like that. So they describe a woman. They take this one over here. You can see that she obviously has it in the neck over here, and I can guarantee you she has an anterior mediastinal mass also. That combination of, of a mass in the anterior mediastinum and a non-painful lymph node in the neck uh, is not just grossing Hodgkin's period. Okay? Uh, this is what it looks like here. Uh, you don't have to know that crap about lacunar cells and all that stuff. That's for pathology residents, not for board examinations. So what's the malignant cell actually in Hodgkin's disease? The Reed Sternberg cell. That's this little dude right here. That's a common picture on boards, guys. It's a common picture on boards. That, that's it for nodular sclerosing. Look, that's nice. It just fell out of my hand and it went ahead. This is cool. I like this. I'm not going to go through the entire uh, meaning of a serum protein electrophoresis other than to say that uh, albumin is the one that migrates the furthest because it has the most negative charges, whereas gamma globulin is kind of like a couch potato. You know, it just where, where they apply the uh, serum, it just sits there. Now, I want you to be familiar with two terms, uh, polyclonal, monoclonal, so that you understand the difference between multiple myeloma and other kinds of things that increase the gamma globulin peak. What's poly mean? Many, okay? Clonal, many clones. Many clones of what? Plasma cells. Because the gamma globulin region is where your gamma globulins are. Now, what's the first three letters of gamma? Of gamma? G, A, M, right? Well, that's the order of the greatest amount, G. The second most uh, is A. The third most is M, and D and E are way down there. So that's an easy way of remembering what's the most abundant uh, globulin. So when we do a, pro a protein electrophoresis and we look in this gamma globulin region, when we see a little peak, we know that it has to be an increase in IgG because that's the most abundant immunoglobulin. And think about it. Didn't you tell me that in chronic inflammation, the primary immunoglobulin was IgG? Remember in acute inflammation, the primary immunoglobulin was 
IgM. And so when you have chronic inflammation, rheum rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, things like that, and where you have increase in IgG, well, that's going to cause the gamma globulin region to show this big diffuse elevation, like, this, like, a, like, a, like a round mountain. This is po called polyclonal gammopathy. That's because many, many benign plasma cells are making IgG, some are making IgM, whatever, but lots of different clones of plasma cells are making their thing. And so you get this diffuse elevation of that peak. So polyclonal gammopathy means what? First of all, it means benign. What else does it mean? Chronic inflammation, period. You're not going to have a polyclonal gammopathy and acute inflammation. You have acute appendicitis, there's not going to be anything. You're not going to see a single thing happen in the gamma globulin region because the main amino globulin is IgM. Remember, that's the third most abundant one, so you're not going to do anything. But when you have chronic inflammation and you've got all that IgG that's being made, that will cause a diffuse elevation of the gamma globulin peak, and that's called polyclonal gammopathy. Always means benign and always means chronic inflammation. Now, monoclonal, we wouldn't want to sit on that sucker, that's for sure. Okay, monoclonal gammopathy, what does that mean? One clone of plasma cells are making immunoglobulin. Well, how could that be? What's to, what's to keep the other ones from making immunoglobulin if they're suppressed? So when you see a monoclonal peak like you see here, that usually almost always, well, let's say almost always means malignancy. Malignancy of what? A plasma cell. And all the other plasma cells are suppressed by immunologic mechanisms. So they're suppressed. Whereas one clone, the malignant clone of plasma cells, makes its immunoglobulin. And because it's just one clone of plasma cells, you get and most of the time it's an IgG malignancy. They make lots of uh, immunoglobulin. They make lots of light chains. The light chains oftentimes get into the urine. And what's, what's that called? Vince Jones protein. Good. So make sure you know the difference between polyclonal and monoclonal. Now while I have this up here, let's just do another one that's not related to this. This is albumin. You know what the next peak is? Alpha 1, alpha 2, beta, and gamma. Just for fun. Let's say you had a person that um, 25, 26, non-smoker, had emphysema in the lower lobes, and you saw a protein electrophoresis, and there was no, this peak, this was gone. It was just flat. There was no alpha-1 peak. What would you diagnose this peak? Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. That's pretty cool, huh? Okay. So polyclonal means benign and means chronic inflammation. Monoclonal usually means malignant, and we're talking about multiple myeloma. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about now. This has all the interesting things. Two pictures up here are key pictures. Both of these pictures have been on boards. Multiple myeloma is a horrible, horrible disease. It's basically incurable, unless you get some kind of bone marrow transplant or something like that. It's incurable. My, my uh, mother-in-law died of this. It's not a very nice disease. Usually you see this in people over 50, so it's not a young person's disease. A little bit more common in women than men. Most common type is an Ig kappa. Uh, a type of, uh, of multiple myeloma. Remember that plasma cells have interleukin-1. Another name for interleukin-1 is osteoclast activating factor. So take a look at this skull over here. Okay, do you see lots of lytic lesions in here, don't you? Huh? See them? See them? Okay. Notice they're pretty cookie cutter. They're not like, uh, like irregular borders to them. Okay, they're nice and pretty much round. Looks like, you know, someone just took something just like that. Nice, nice, neat cut. And Paget's disease of bone isn't nice and neat. Paget's disease of bone also has lytic areas, but they're very, very fuzzy looking. So there's no way that you can confuse Paget's disease of bone uh, with multiple myeloma. This is multiple myeloma. Nice cookie cutter, sharp borders to the lytic areas. That's because interleukin-1 activates osteoclasts. And so they just bore a hole through the bone there, and they produce these lytic areas. So obviously, if this was, let's say, in a rib, and you coughed, what could potentially happen if you had a lytic lesion in a rib? You could fracture. So pathologic fractures are extremely common. The one I usually like on board is an elderly woman, let's say, who coughs, and she develops severe pain. Okay? She comes in, and, and uh, you see uh, there's some point tenderness over the rib. They do an x-ray, and they see a lytic lesion with a pathologic fracture there. And then they ask you, what's, what's the patient have multiple myeloma? That's the way they usually ask it on boards. Okay. 
Um, make, take a good look. You've seen this picture before. Take a good look at what a plasma cell looks like. There is no way you should ever confuse a plasma cell with any other cell. Okay? It's basically a cell that has a bright blue cytoplasm. Very, very few cells have bright blue cytoplasm. Notice the nucleus is eccentrically located. Notice that usually right next to the nucleus, this little clear area is present. Okay? If it did an electron microscopy of that cell, what would you see? What would be the characteristic thing you'd see in the cytosol? Can't you remember it from the inflammation lectures? What did it look like? They had these little layers. Remember, layers and layers of what? Smooth endoplasmic reticulum? No. What was it? Ribosomes, rough endoplasmic reticulum. Remember, there were just sheets and sheets of it. Why? Because it's constantly making protein. Remember, ribosomes is what ribosomal RNA sits on, huh? Okay? So very, very important that you know what a plasma cell looks like uh, on, on an H and E stain, I mean a right gene sustain, and also on a electron microscope. Very important. Okay. Multiple myeloma. Lytic lesions, elderly patient, Bench Jones protein, that's the key things you want to remember. This is what amyloid looks like on electron microscopy. Notice it's a, it's a non branching linear compound. Notice it has a hole in the center of it. They usually ask maybe one or two questions on amyloidosis because it always seems to end up in a differential diagnosis for multi system disease. You always have to put systemic amyloidosis down there as a possibility. It's very interesting. Amyloid is a protein. You all know that. But what's interesting is, is that many different kinds of proteins can be converted into it. Okay? So it's, 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 a, it's a unique protein, but many different kinds of protein are transformed into this unique protein. Okay? For example, a prealbumin can be converted into amyloid. Uh, you told me uh, not to, yeah, I think it was yesterday. You told me about calcitonin, the tumor marker for medullary carcinoma of the thyroid. It can be converted into amyloid. Okay? Light chains in multiple myeloma can be converted into amyloid. And what if I had trisomy 21? What is, what is chromosome 21 code for? Beta amyloid protein. So if you had three chromosome 21s, then you'd make a little bit more beta uh, uh, amyloid, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Okay, now do you know, happen to know what beta amyloid protein does? It's toxic to neurons. And so if you have trisomy 21 and you're making more beta amyloid protein, then you're obviously going to be losing more neurons because there's more of this protein that, that is toxic to neurons. This is why they always ask the question about the person that dies at age 40 and an autopsy is done and reveals atrophy in the brain and reveals senile plaques in the frontal and temporal lobe. They call them senile plaques. So when we get to CNS, I'll show you what they are. And then I'll ask you, well, who's the patient? And the answer is Down syndrome. See, uh, Down syndrome patients will all get Alzheimer's disease if they happen to live that long. They either die of one or two things. They die in and around childhood from their cardiac disease, endocardial cushion defects, which is a combination of an atrial septal and ventricular septal defect. That's what usually gets them as a kid. But if they manage to live, you know, to 35, 40 years of age, they all get Alzheimer's. That's because of that excess chromosome 21, making excess beta amyloid, and producing Alzheimer's disease. Always asked. Always asked. So a 40-year-old with Alzheimer's disease is who? A child with a, a patient with Down syndrome. That is correct. Good. That's about it for amyloid. There's not much more important in it. The key thing is, uh, is to remember the beta amyloid. That's probably the most important one to remember for Alzheimer's disease. I just put these two things in just for fun because you're having biochemistry coming up and you'll be discussing lysosomal storage diseases. Okay? These are two favorite cells that they like to put on, uh, on, on examinations that deal with this because it re relates to biochemistry. Uh, this is a macrophage, and it's got this kind of crinkly, paper-like, uh, wrinkled type of appearance in the cytoplasm. I will tell you that the lysosomes are filled with glucocerebroside. So therefore, what would the disease be on that top one? Gauchet very good. An ozonal recessive disease where they're missing glucocerebrosidase. Therefore, they can't break down glucocerebroside. Very good. So take another look at it, kind of a wrinkled cytoplasm. Kind of like you took paper and really wrinkled it up. Hmm? Now take a look at the bottom one. 
you get the appearance of feeling that bubbly looking, huh? Kind of bubbles. It's just kind of like, it looks like little bubbles in there. Okay, this patient has a, a cherry red macula. Okay, Sachs disease. Okay, now, wrong. Excuse me, I was wrong. Forget the cherry red macula. <laughs> I was wrong. Uh, this patient has severe mental retardation. And I'll tell you that the buildup product in the lysosomes is sphingomyelin. Nemontic, okay. Nemontic is, sorry I screwed up on that tay sacs thing. Uh, uh, Nemontic doesn't have a cherry red macula. But it does have severe mental retardation and a missing sphingomyelinase. So sphingomyelin is the thing that's increased. Okay. Who can tell me the only uh, glycogen storage disease that is lysosomal storage? Is it Ron Gierke's? No. Is it McArdle's? No. You're saying nothing because you don't know you what any of these are, right? <laughs> okay. Is it Pompeii's? Yes. Pompeii's is the only glycogen storage disease with lysosomal storage because it's missing an enzyme to break glycogen down in the lysosomes. Anybody remember how they die, patients with Pompeii's disease? Cardiac. They get excess deposition of normal glycogen in the heart, and that's what kills them. Okay. Good. So, what's the name of this uh, disease with the bubbly cytoplasm? Nemon picks. What's the one with the wrinkled up cytoplasm? Gaucher's. Very good. Both are examples of lysosomal storage diseases. Okay. Coagulation. Coagulation. Here's another bugaboo. Most students, when they went through coagulation, oh, God, you had all that cascade system and all that stuff. I'm going to really try to totally confuse you with it because I'm going to use the most complex slide I can think of to teach you that. Okay? It's so complex, it's just literally, you just can't possibly understand it. Okay? Look at all those things all over the place. I have such a complicated looking slide, kind of like a netter slide. You know? Okay? But anyway,